It is an honor and a privilege to welcome Senator Chris Van Hollen. Senator Van Hollen is truly an inspiring leader and a dedicated public servant. He is relatively new to the Senate, starting in January of this year, but before that he represented Maryland for over 14 years in the House of Representatives. In addition to his work on clean energy, support for women's rights, and childhood education, Senator Van Hollen has shown time and again his dedication to diplomacy and his commitment to American national security. In the summer of 2015, Senator Van Hollen showed his, the courage for which he is known through his support for the Iran nuclear agreement. This was at the height of the congressional debate over the Iran deal. It was also in the middle of his race for the Senate. At that time, many other lawmakers were hesitant to support negotiations with Iran. Senator Van Hollen showed no such hesitation. He stood up for diplomacy and he did the right thing for our country and for that we are truly grateful. We need his courage and his leadership more than ever today. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Please join me in welcoming Senator Chris Van Hollen. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, and thank you for your terrific work as the Deputy Policy uh, Director here, and it's also great to have you as a constituent in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, I also wanna, I wanna thank Mary Lloyd uh, Estrin, I, Estrin, I, is she here? Uh, thank her for her leadership uh, as chair of the, <laughs> chair of the board, and uh, welcoming Terry Gamble Boyer as the new head of the board. It, you've been both providing incredible leadership and I look forward to continuing to work with you in the Plowshares Fund as we go. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank uh, your fearless uh, president, Joseph Cirincioni, and his, his terrific team that you've assembled here at the Plowshares Fund. So I think it's fair to say that the work of Plowshares is more important than it's ever been before and that the security of the United States and indeed the security of the international community uh, is at stake. Uh, back in the 1980s, long before I was even thinking of running for elected office myself, uh, I worked on Capitol Hill as a legislative assistant uh, for national security and, and arms control uh, for Maryland Senator Mac Mathias. Uh, he was a liberal Republican senator from Maryland. He teamed up with Senator Kennedy, they introduced the comprehensive test ban uh, legislation and really worked together on a bipartisan basis to address uh, the important nuclear and security issues uh, of the 1980s. And at that time, I was an avid reader of a publication which is still in existence today uh, called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And as many as you know, they have a doomsday clock and they set that clock January of every year based on the events uh, that are going on in the world and their projection of future events. And the doomsday clock, of course, is supposed to give you an idea of how close we are to the pre precipice of nuclear conflict. Uh, the closest it's ever come, and again, this is not done updating all through the year, it's January of each year, the closest it's ever come was in 1953. Uh, the clock was two minutes to midnight, two minutes to doomsday. The farthest it's been uh, from that midnight hour was in 1991, at the end of the Cold War. It was 17 minutes uh, to doomsday. Uh, this past January, they moved the clock from three minutes, a pretty tense moment, to doomsday, to two and a half minutes to doomsday. As explained by their editor, quote, even before he moved into the White House, President Trump had, in the board's view, said and done things that had made the world more dangerous, end quote. That was in January. I'm absolutely confident that if the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists were doing a update at this moment, uh, they would move those hands even closer. How much closer? I don't know. And that's obviously a question uh, that all of us need to examine closely and work hard to avoid. And that is in large part due because of the mishandling 
and reckless approach to two major hotspots in the world. One, of course, is North Korea, uh, which is a conflict that heats up by the day. And the other is the threatened unraveling, and really the first step toward the unraveling of the Iran nuclear agreement. And I do want to thank uh, Joe Serencioni and Plowshares for the very important advocacy role you all played in passing the Iran nuclear agreement because it was a very important <laughs> agreement. And let's start with what we know. Let's start with what we know, that the agreement is having its intended effect of cutting off Iran's pathways towards developing a nuclear weapon. I'm not going to go through every detail, but the reality is that Iran was right on the brink of having the ability to get highly enriched uranium and quantities of uranium that would have put it over that threshold. And it is a far step back from that brink uh, today. And that's a result of that agreement. Second, we know that Iran is complying uh, with the agreement, which is exactly why Secretary of Defense Mattis told Congress on October 3rd, just a short time ago, that sticking with the agreement was in the U.S. national security interest. Let me say that again. The Secretary of Defense told Congress just a few weeks ago that sticking with the agreement was in our national security interest. That, of course, is the view of all of our European allies who were parties to this agreement, the U.K., Germany, France. It's also the view of China and Russia, who are also signatories. And even former Israeli Prime Minister and Defense Minister Ehud Barak, who had been opposed to the original agreement, has said it would be a big mistake for us to break out, tear up this particular agreement. And yet, despite all the evidence and despite that advice from national security leaders, we know that President Trump decided to decertify the agreement. Now, make no mistake, decertification had nothing to do with improving our national security. In fact, it's going to hurt our national security. It had nothing to do with any violations of the agreement because they'd previously certified this agreement and there had been nothing that changed. There's no evidence. The, re the, the, the resolution requires them to present evidence of violation. No evidence. So it was clearly a move driven entirely by politics at the expense of our national security. Now, we've also seen that decertification take place with no with no alternative to how we would make sure that Iran doesn't resume its ability to develop more nuclear weapons material in the event that we were to toss up the agreement. Instead, uh, we've just seen the matter thrown to the Congress, and of course the decertification started the ticking of a clock of 60 days in which Congress can take but is not required to take action. And while it appears right now that there's no intention to take action to actually reimpose the sanctions in whole or in part, we don't know. We just don't know. And a lot can happen in the meantime. What we do know is that uh, Senators Corker and Cotton are in the process of working up legislation uh, to amend the Iran Nuclear Agreement um, Review Act, which was the act that Congress passed, kind of the implementing legislation to oversee uh, the agreement. That has not been made public, but there are lots of sort of bootleg copies uh, that have been going around. And if those bootleg copies reflect what will be in any ultimate proposal, uh, they will essentially be calling for a violation of the agreement uh, because they would be calling for Number one, uh, imposing the Iran sanctions on non-nuclear related conduct. And number two, they would be extending uh, the sunset provisions uh, that had been negotiated in the bill. I want to be really clear, if you, if you tear up an agreement, you sunset everything right now. <laughs> you sunset it today. Iran would have no obligation to do anything more under the agreement. So we need to work hard to make sure that Congress does not pass that legislation.
uh, or take action to immediately reimpose sanctions in whole or in part. We all know that Congress really can't, quote, fix the agreement. It's not a bilateral agreement. Now, first of all, we'd have to negotiate with the Iranians, but we also have all the other parties that I mentioned who have said that they're sticking to the agreement. So it's pretty clear that if we tear up the agreement or walk away from the agreement, we're not isolating Iran. We're obviously isolating the United States uh, and at the same time undermine our national security. Now, I want to be clear because we've heard lots of concerns raised about the agreement that it didn't cover all Iranian conduct that we don't like. And it is absolutely true that Iran is engaged in activity in the Middle East that is against our interest and is destabilizing. But the conclusion that was reached, and it was a good one, is that a nuclear armed Iran engaging in those activities is much more dangerous to our interests in the world than a non-nuclear Iran engaged in those activities. That's number one. And number two, Congress has taken actions against those other destabilizing activities that Iran is engaged in, including the testing of ballistic missiles uh, and other activities. Uh, in fact, the Congress passed a law in July, part of a sanctions bill on Korea, on Russia, and Iran, that gave the President additional authorities to take sanctions against Iran for some of this activity. And as we know, uh, there are over 100 individuals have been designated Iranian individuals for some of their violations. The Senate also recently passed legislation uh, sanctioning Hezbollah and its proxies and uh, other actions that we've been taking. So there are other tools at our disposal to address those issues without undermining the agreement, uh, which was based on that assessment that a nuclear-armed Iran engaging in these activities is much more dangerous than a non-nuclear Iran. Of course, the other big risk of essentially manufacturing reasons to walk away from the Iran nuclear agreement, even though Iran's complying with it, is that it undermines the confidence of our allies and certainly undermines our ability to try to reach future agreements, for example, in the case of North Korea. And it just sends an awful signal to the world that the United States cannot be counted on to keep its end of a bargain. And that erosion of our credibility uh, will really create problems for our national security as we go down the line if we continue to see that erosion. I want to say a word about uh, North Korea, because North Korea does represent a threat to the United States and its allies, South Korea and Japan. Uh, we know now, according to General Dunford, that they have the capacity to uh, launch an intercontinental ballistic missile that can hit the mainland of the United States. We know that they've ramped up their missile tests. They fired two uh, ballistic missiles over Japan, and they conducted their six tests of a nuclear weapon uh, recently, their biggest yet. And as you've probably seen yesterday and again today, the foreign minister of Korea is threatening to do an atmospheric uh, nuclear uh, test. So that is a, a real danger and a real threat on the peninsula and to global security. And we need to be really smart about how we deal with it. And President Trump is playing a very dangerous game by engaging in this war of words with the North Korean leader. In fact, I don't think it's only dangerous, I think it undermines uh, the US position, it elevates the North Korean leader to a war of words with the President of the United States, and frankly, it feeds the narrative of the North Korean leader who have been telling the people of North Korea forever that the United States is determined to wipe them out. So when the President of the United States goes before the United Nations and threatens to, quote, totally destroy North Korea, that only empowers the leaders in North uh, Korea. And of course, they responded by saying that was a, quote, declaration of war. So I think the president would do well to heed the advice of President Teddy Roosevelt, who said, speak softly, 
but carry a big stick. And it is important if we're dealing with North Korea, and we all know how difficult the challenge with North Korea is, and no one's going to underestimate this. And the reality is that previous administrations, Republicans or Demo and Democratic administrations, have not succeeded in stopping their continuing steps toward the development of nuclear weapons and, and uh, producing nuclear weapons and, and missile technology. And so this is a tough, tough issue. But you do need diplomacy. It doesn't help at all when the President of the United States undermines the Secretary of State and tweets out that you know, you're wasting your time by engaging in diplomacy. We need to engage in diplomacy, but it does need to be backed up uh, by additional international action. I do want to say a word about this because, uh, you know, I, I, I recognize how difficult it is to increase economic leverage against North Korea, but I think the facts show that there's still significant room to put additional economic pressure on North Korea as we try to discuss uh, a resolution at the negotiating table. Uh, the United Nations uh, Special Experts Panel uh, in August and earlier in, in, in January actually identified a whole list of firms around the world that were not complying with the UN sanctions. Now the UN, as you know, the UN Security Council has now passed a series of sanctions on North Korea, tighter and tighter and tighter, but there's a big difference between passing sanctions and having them on paper and actually implementing those sanctions. And the reality is there are lots of actors out there that continue to violate those sanctions. Uh, of course, China uh, represents 90% of the trade with uh, North Korea. Uh, and we need to make sure that we get them to help us put pressure on North Korea. And we need tools to do that. And so I have introduced bipartisan legislation with Senator Toomey to essentially apply the Iran sanctions model to North Korea, which means secondary sanctions. So that means that if there are Chinese banks that continue to engage in business with North Korea, they will no longer have access to the United States markets. That was the model of the Iran sanctions uh, legislation. Uh, I do believe that legislation played an important role in bringing Iran to the table, and then the United States and our partners took advantage of that legislation to negotiate the agreement. We need to bring that same amount of economic pressure to bear on North Korea, and that is the purpose of this legislation, and I think it will be uh, taking up taken up in the Senate Banking Committee uh, in the weeks uh, to come, and I urge you uh, to help us uh, pass that legislation so we have those additional tools short of the kind of actions that some are threatening uh, to put pressure on North Korea as we uh, go forward. And I'm not under any, illusion, any, under any illusions that, that that's necessarily going to result in agreement. But here's what I do know. <laughs> We've got to exhaust all of our uh, diplomatic and economic options before people go around talking about a catastrophe on the Korean Peninsula, which would result in the deaths of millions and millions of people, uh, American soldiers in Japan and uh, Korea, and of course, uh, people, millions of people in South Korea as well. And we should not even be talking about threatening those things. Uh, and we need to be focused on the diplomatic solution, but we need to do it by ratcheting up the economic pressure uh, as we go. Uh, I, I'm going to just close with this. I was, I don't know if Senator, was Senator Markey here earlier? I don't know if he mentioned uh, we took a trip uh, in August. We took a bipartisan trip uh, to South Korea. Japan and China, uh, where we went to the DMZ uh, between North Korea and South Korea, but also uh, went for the first time, I think any delegation has gone up to the city of Dandong, which is on the North Korean Chinese border. It's where the Yalu River is. And that is where you see a lot of the cross border economic activity uh, between China and North Korea. And the purpose of additional sanctions is to uh, choke off that economic uh, activity and build more pressure uh, on uh, North Korea. And I know people say China will never ultimately take the kind of 
really tough actions. But I will tell you, um, there are different kinds of chaos you could have uh, on, the, on the Korean Peninsula. And I think China would be very wise to maximize, work with us to maximize uh, the pressure on North Korea and get them to work with us on an agreement uh, to first freeze their activities and then look for the ultimate goal of denuclearizing the North Korean Peninsula. So thank all of you here at Plowshares uh, for the important role you play in number one, bringing facts and information uh, to the public uh, and number two, advocating uh, for a more peaceful world and a world ultimately uh, without nuclear weapons. So thank you all very much uh, for having me.